friends, and welcome to Sleepy Town Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Now before we go any further, if you don't mind taking a little time with me, I need to do a little bit of self-promotion and advertising type stuff. Most podcasts put it halfway through or towards the end, but if all goes well, you're going to be asleep before we get there, so I need to put this up front. The show is, as always, brought to you by supporters on Patreon. I'm hearing from more people all the time how valuable they find the show, and those supporters have the means to help fund it. To keep it going and help me to reach new audiences are very much appreciated. So if you're making use of Sleepy Time Tales regularly to help you deal with sleeplessness, and you have the urge to support the show, and most importantly, of course, if you can and have the means, please check out patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, go to the link in the show notes or from the website, and take a look at what's available. You will have the satisfaction of knowing that you're contributing to the rest and lifestyle improvement of thousands of people, and over and above that, there are real rewards available from as little as $2 a month. There's early releases on the weekly episodes, weekly bonus episodes, and special edits of the main show, depending on the level you support at. And if it's a little bit much to support every month, you can also chuck a little something in the tip jar if you've got some extra cash that you found behind the couch or under the couch cushions, uh, or take a look at the merchandise store and um, a couple of other options as well. In fact, another one of those options is to take a look at our um, partner. Uh, BetterHelp is a online therapy service. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 24 hours once you sign up. This is not a crisis line. It is not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network which may not be locally available in your area. The service is available worldwide, and you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counsellor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. And in this day and age with social distancing and people not going out in public, that's even more valuable than it's ever been. People also often struggle to find a counsellor who they really understands them and who they can get on with. So BetterHelp makes it easier by making it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counselling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a better life today. If you're interested in taking a look, go to trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime. That's trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime and join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Sleepy Time Tales listeners get 10% off their first month if you use that link. That's trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime. And of course, last but not least, I have to shout out the music. The song is Un Désert by Kumiku from Loyalty Freak Music. Their music is available on their website, loyaltyfreakmusic.com take a look in the link in the show notes and they've got a lot of stuff available there and i've actually recently done the right thing which i should have done a while before but uh, covid and lockdowns and stuff made finances a bit of an issue i've recently started backing them on patreon myself which you can also find from their website and um thank you for taking the time and let's get back to the show So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It is a strange idea, a podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. 
but in this 21st century, lack of sleep is a health crisis, and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, sleep was always a struggle for me. A lot of people I knew liked sleeping with the TV or the radio on, but it wasn't something that really worked for me, because I used to find the, t- the lights from the TV distracting, or the loud ad- ads, or the music on the radio, or also loud ads on those. So I opted out of those and tended to try to keep as much silence as possible. It didn't really work very well for me, and when I eventually discovered that uh, sometimes at night when I was expecting to lie awake, I would go to bed with podcasts to listen to, and I'd find myself falling asleep while I was listening to those. They acted almost like a sedative for me, and I think I thought I figured out what probably was was podcasts have a tendency to be have a sort of consistent volume and energy through them. Even when you listen to ads on a podcast, they're not different tone and um, volume so much because it's usually host read stuff. So it's always really integrated into a whole thing for me. And of course, there's no light or usually music, which would be distracting. So I started listening to podcasts specifically for the purpose of helping me to sleep. And then I discovered that there are ones out there actually designed for the purpose. Not just the old video game podcasts and movie podcasts that I had selected to fall asleep to. There were ones there where people were deliberately trying to bore their listeners to sleep. I tried, I found a podcast or two that worked for me. But when I recommended them to other people, they didn't quite resonate for various reasons. Sometimes they didn't like the narrator's voice, or they didn't like the topics, or the way they told the stories and stuff. So I thought to myself, I've got this boring, droney voice, and I can do things a little bit differently to the way other people are doing theirs. So let me see if I can try to step into a space and help people that the existing shows that I had found at that point couldn't. And that's when I started up Sleepy Time Tales. Now every episode starts with this long intro. It serves two purposes. Uh, The first one obviously is I need to make the case for people who might not be familiar with a sleep podcast or how, what the whole point of it is. And I need to sort of explain it and make a case for it and try to overcome what I think is a natural kind of resistance to the idea. It is a bit of a strange one, as I, I think I mentioned already. And for people who've been listening to the show for a while, it serves another purpose. The now often, often insomnia is it's more than anything else. It's a bad habit. It's we've have bad sleep hygiene and have bad bad um, pre bed bedtime rituals and stuff like that. So we tend to be doing something with high energy, watching TV or um bright lights or something like that and then we try to get to bed and our minds aren't actually in a restful state and whatever we do is an uphill battle to help us so i have this long intro which is pretty much the same most of the time although i do redo it every week and i sometimes forget where i am in the story or the intro rather rather than the story i forget where i am i get a little bit sidetracked and stuff like that Basically, it boils down to me just waffling on explaining the concepts of the show and stuff like that. And for people who've been listening to the show for a while, it is it helps create a buffer between going to bed and the story. This is, uh, if you haven't yet, this is where you can have a drink of water and brush your teeth and get ready to go to sleep. Because by the time you get into bed and by the time the story starts you are in a receptive sort of state to for sleep to come for you. Now, as far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. 
for a lot of people, it's something to listen to, something to focus on, and a story that keeps the mind, mind, the attention of the mind, so it doesn't spin out into stresses and anxieties, those things that grab our attention when we close our eyes and try to prevent us from sleeping. And for other people, it may be something a little bit different, a little, maybe a little bit more primal even. People like white noise or something like that these days, and that's um, kind of uh, an option here. You may like the sound of the wind in the trees, or um, rain, or the ocean, or maybe just some boring dude droning on in the background. Tonight's story, as we're getting close to Christmas, is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It's um, probably his most well-known story, and um, seems apropos for the time of year. It actually struck me the other day, like, I'd only do Christmas-themed things rather than other holidays for other traditions. But to be honest, I don't know if I could do justice to other people's beliefs and other people's traditions. Would it make sense for me, a person who doesn't know anything about Jewish culture, to do Hanukkah stories or Ramadan stories for, for Muslim listeners? I don't know. If you're one of those traditions and you think it makes sense, pop me a line, let me know. Or if you'd rather stay well away from it, pop me a line as well and let me know about that. Um, the, point, the point is, whatever the story is, and this tonight, as I say, it's a Charles Dickens classic, the important thing is that you don't try for sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the story as, as I'm telling it and uh, allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now, if all goes well, you're going to be asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it is important you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night, this may not work for you. In fact, odds are pretty good it won't. It'll probably take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice or adjusting to my accent getting used to the idea of it. I suggest give it a good three nights try. If by the end of three nights, if it's not helping you, then it probably won't. But if you like the idea, there are a lot of other shows out there. My personal favorites are Boring Books for Bedtime and Sleep With Me. Those are the ones that I use to sleep. And also uh, Nothing Much Happens. That's another really good show, very high quality. And um, they, they may help you as well as me, as well as instead as me because sometimes a little bit of variety is nice. It's also possible that one episode just isn't long enough. What I actually do, because my tendency is not so much that I can't go to sleep anymore, I actually usually fall asleep quite fast these days, but what happens with me is I wake up at 3am and I can't get back to sleep, or I kind of don't even realise I'm awake and I end up having laid awake for three hours and the alarm's going and I was sort of half asleep and not realizing that I wasn't getting any actual rest. So what I do is I download a whole few, a bunch of episodes of the shows that I listen to. I usually start with the latest one and then I let them run all night. Then when I wake up at 3am, I pop them in my ears and waft back to sleep again. Sometimes even I wake up 30 minutes or 60 minutes before my alarm and I do the same thing then may seem strange to want to go to sleep 30 minutes before your alarm goes, but I've got to tell you, in my experience, that 30 minutes can be the most restful part of my night. But if you're trying to go to sleep or you're waking up in the middle of the night, what is very important is that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights, lying staring at the ceiling, this may seem, seem strange to you. So just give it a bit of a chance. And that's the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend, who has elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice, you will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you to relax, to improve your life in a small way, or maybe uh, do my small part to help you in a big way, because people don't sleep very well these days, and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to cope and process. I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. We live in an unkind age quite a lot now and um, life is hard and I want to be kind to you. 
I want to share kindness with you. And most importantly, you need to be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense if you just can't get over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep, and the intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration. To distract the feeling we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep into a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It's a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and supposed progress shining bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Introduction The combined qualities of the realist and the idealist which Dickens possessed to a remarkable degree, together with his naturally jovial attitude towards life in general, seem to have given him a remarkably happy feeling towards Christmas. Though the privations and hardships of his boyhood could have allowed him but little real experience with this day of days. Dickens gave his first formal expression to his Christmas thoughts in a series of small books the first of which was the famous Christmas Carol, the one perfect chrysolite. The success of the book was immediate. Thackeray wrote of it, Those who can listen to objections regarding such a book as this, it seems to me a natural benefit, and to every man or woman who reads it, a personal kindness. This volume was put forth in a very attractive manner, with illustrations by John Leach, who was the first artist to make these characters live and his drawings were varied and spirited. They followed upon this four others, the charms, the cricket on the hearth, the battle of life, and the haunted man, with illustrations on their first appearance by Doyle, MacLeese, and others. The five are known today as the Christmas books. Of them all, the carol is the best known and loved, and cricket on the hearth, although third in the series, is perhaps next in point of popularity and is especially familiar to Americans, through Joseph Jefferson's characterization of Caleb Plummer. Dickens seems to have put his whole self into these glowing little stories. Whoever sees but a clever ghost story in The Christmas Carol misses its chief charm and lesson, for there is a different meaning in the movements of Scrooge and his attendant spirits. A new life is brought to Scrooge when he, running to his window, opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, jovial, stirring cold. Cold, popping for the blood to dance to. Golden sunlight. Heavenly sky. Sweet, fresh air. Merry bells. Oh, glorious, glorious. All this brightness has its attendant shadow. And deep from the childish heart comes the true notes of pathos. The ever-memorable toast of Tiny Tim. God bless us, everyone. The cricket on the hearth strikes a different note. Charmingly, poetically, the sweet chirping of the little cricket is associated with human feelings and actions, and at the crisis of the story decides the fate and fortune of the carrier and his wife. Dickens's greatest gift was characterization, and no English writer save Shakespeare has drawn so many and so varied characters. It would be as absurd to interpret all of these caricatures as to deny Dickens his great and varied powers of creation. 
Dickens exaggerated many of his comic and satirical characters, as was his right, for caricature and satire are very closely related, while exaggeration is the very essence of comedy. But there remains a host of characters mocked by humour and pathos, yet the pictorial presentation of Dickens's characters has ever tended towards the grotesque. The interpretations in this volume aim to eliminate the grosser phase of the caricature in favour of the more human. If the interpretation seemed novel, if Scrooge be not as he has been pictured, it is because a more human Scrooge was desired. A Scrooge not wholly bad, a Scrooge of a better heart, a Scrooge to whom the resurrection described in the story was possible. It has been the illustrator's whole aim to make these people live in some form more fully consistent with their types. George Alfred Williams, Chatham, New Jersey Stave 1 Marley's Ghost Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of, of my own knowledge, what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat, emphatically, that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night, in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot. Say St. Paul's churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley but he answered to both names, it was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He asked his coffee in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warm could warm, no wintry weather chill him, no wind that blew was bitterer than he, no falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars employed him to bestow a trifle. No children were asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. 
Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, they would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than this evil eye, Dark Master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Was what the knowing one called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with a shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you, cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said bah, and followed up with humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas, out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen months presented dead against you. If you could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes down and brought with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart he should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly, Keep Christmas in your own way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated the Scrooge's nephew, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you, much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, but which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the rest but I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it was come around, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything. Belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, forgivable, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, that has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it.
The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frill spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, down with us tomorrow. Scrooge said he would see him. Yes, indeed, he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrels which I have been a party, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. He stopped to the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by a surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for there had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word, liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses? demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are. Still, returned the gentleman, I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour then, said the Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in the useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian share of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned, they cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. 
But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself and a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street, at the corner of the court, some labourers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before a blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing suddenly congealed and turned to a misanthropic ass. The brightness of the shops, where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows, made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, in which it was next impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as the Lord Manor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy beef. Foggier yet and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold, if the good St. Dunstan had but nipped evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God bless you merry gentlemen may nothing you dismay, Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length the hour of shutting up the counting-house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'd be bound. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed there was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to his chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clock promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill, at the end of a lane of boys, twenty times in honour of it being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's books, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. There were a gloomy suite of rooms and a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide and seek with other houses, and had forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms all being let out as offices. 
The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was faint to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about that knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, alderman, and livery. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years' dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath of hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That and its livid colour made it horrible, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in and lighted his candle. He did pause with a moment's irresolution before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall but there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on, so I said poo-poo and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs, or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise with the splitter bar towards the wall, and the door towards the balustrades and done it easy. There was plenty of width for that and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive horse going before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out in the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dub. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for that. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room. All as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes. Two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it, 
before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all around with quaint Dutch tiles, designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's, apostles running off to sea in butter boats. Hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts, and yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated, for some purpose now forgotten, with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with great inexplicable dread. As he looked, he saw this bell began to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bell ceased as they had begun together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then something coming straight towards the door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His colour changed though when, without a pause, it came through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leapt up as those cried, I know him, Marley's ghost and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked at the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its neck and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now, said Scrooge, as caustic and cold as ever, what do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Asked me who I was. Who were you then, said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular for a shade. He was going to say, to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down, asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that, in the event of it being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your own senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? 
Because said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blob of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave without you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt the very deuce with him. There was something very awful too in the spectre's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of his own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as by the hot vapour from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned, and wishing that it were only for a second, to divert the ghost's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You're not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I'll have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom, taking off the bandage round his head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the horse returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not fall forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world, O oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. Again the spectre raised a cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fitted, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and long as this seven Christmas eves ago. You have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, old Jacob Morley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hall, and weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge whenever he became thoughtful to put his hands in his breeches' pockets. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting his eyes up or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed in a businesslike manner, though with humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge, and travelling all the time? The whole time, said the ghost, no rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. 
on the wings of the real wind, replied the ghost. You must have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. O oh, captive, bound and double-ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labour by mortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its fast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's missed opportunities. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But you're always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the spectre said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob, pray. How is it that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his bow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I have them all at once and have it over, Jacob? hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took his wrapper from the table, and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and over about its arm. The apparition walked backwards from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused voices in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. 
the air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw blow on upon its doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters, and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into mist or mist entrouded them he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it has been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant. And as Scrooge goes to sleep, I'm hoping you're well asleep, dear listener. I think we're going to end it there tonight. Christmas Carol is available literally everywhere in the world, including Done by the Muppets and Starring Bill Murray. So if you like the story, there's lots of places for it. This particular edition that I'm reading from is available on Rock Project Gutenberg and has some really lovely illustrations, so I do recommend taking a look. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales. The podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes are released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Un Desert by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams.